Hello, and welcome back once again to the HR Social Hour Half Hour Podcast. This is episode 45. John and Wendy talk to Jason Lawrenson. I'm your host, John. And I'm Wendy. John, we're getting awful close to 50. <laughs> I, I still don't believe it. I know. And, and it's amazing because between the shows that we rec- put out every Thursday mm-hmm. and then the other shows, you know, by the time this show comes out is episode 45, we're going to have put out like 60 some odd episodes this year, wow. which is mind boggling to it me. Is. Uh, and and but, so that means between us, we've recorded, edited, produced a lot of great content. Yes. I like to think it's great. Hopefully our, and I think <laughs> hopefully our guests appreciate it. Hopefully our <laughs> listeners appreciate it. Yes. As we, when we hit 50, that is going to be a John and Wendy one-on-one yep. show again. And Wendy, maybe talk a little bit about kind of what, in a, at a high level, what our plan is and what we're asking for from the listeners. Yeah, we, you know, we want to celebrate and we want to, uh, to celebrate with y'all. So send us your good wishes, send us happy tweets, send us, you know, something that says you've been listening and, and uh, what you enjoy about the show. Um, and if you have a favorite, is there a favorite moment? Is there a favorite episode that, um, that you want to share? You know, I'm going to call, I called it out on Twitter a while ago. Um, but the fact that you can hear Keith Enox's ice in his bourbon glass, I think is just awesome. <laughs> um, so that's probably one of my favorites. But we want to hear from from all of our, our listeners and our guests and, and what's been your favorite and where where do we need to go? What should we do next? We're again we're really excited and in case anybody does wonder, we actually have a guest for episode one hundred already booked. So we are not going anywhere. We're not going to announce anytime soon who that is. That person approached me a while back and said, Hey, I'd like to do episode one hundred. I said, Absolutely. It gives us something to work to. So absolutely since if you if you if you have something you'd want us to talk about in episode fifty, shoot us a note. You can send us a a voice message, uh, yeah. voice text or anything like that. Yeah. You know how to get a hold of us. We'll talk about it at the end, but enough about episode 50. Yes. We're on 45 right now. Yes. I, I'm really excited about this guest. I first heard him, I think on Lori Rudiman's show and I, I loved what he was saying and I know you've had a chance to meet him. So yep. I'll let you yeah. make the introduction. We'll get going. We'll, we'll jump on in. Yeah. Super excited to welcome Jason to the show. I did have a chance to meet him before uh, Disrupt HR Omaha where we both spoke. So it was, uh, it was great to grab a, a quick coffee with him before that. Um, but Jason is a keynote speaker, author, and consultant. He is an employee engagement workplace culture expert who will challenge you to think differently. He's a former corporate HR executive. He has dedicated his career to helping leaders build organizations that are good for both people and profits. He also led research team for Quantum Workplace's Best Places to Work program, where he has studied the employee experience at thousands of companies to understand what the best workplaces in the world do differently than the rest. Jason is the author of the books, Unlocking High Performance, How to Use Performance Management to Engage and Empower Employees to Reach Their Full Potential, and Social Gravity, Harnessing the Natural Laws of Relationships. Jason, welcome to the show tonight. And our first question is, what's in your glass? Well, thanks for having me. I'm glad to be here. And and tonight I am uh, pretty tame. I'm uh, drinking water this evening. Normally I would be, you know, a glass or wine, uh, a glass of wine or two deep at this point. <laughs> but uh, with the time change, I'm I'm uh, I'm struggling. I, I admit I was up like at three thirty this morning. So I, you know, I'm, right. I'm fighting through. Yeah. Oh, I, yeah. I have to say, you're probably not the only person that's dealing with that, and I certainly understand and. I've got water as well for once. Everybody talks about time change yet. They never do anything about I, it. I right? hope it gets on a ballot like at some point. We, we Europe finally it. got it right. So maybe there's hope for us. <laughs> what you is know, it? Indiana and Arizona, right? Yeah. Aren't they the only right. states that don't change? <laughs> I think so. You know, a politician could probably do really well with that as their platform. One would think. Maybe maybe next election cycle because we're, we're past it by the time the show comes out, but you know, Jason, as I mentioned, you know, we've had, not had a chance to meet, but I've, I've heard you speak. I've heard your podcast several times. And I, I'm curious, though, how exactly did you first get into human resources as a career? You know, that's that's a great question. And I don't know. I mean, probably, you know, like a lot of people, it happened sort of by accident. For me, as I think back on this, I feel like I feel like my career was sort of uh, a progression of of finding my way towards my calling. Like I can't think of doing anything other than what I do today or being in this work. 
And it only made sense that that path, I mean, because I, because I'm so fascinated by work and the dynamics of people, human beings with work and the workplace and all of that, it had to pull me into, into HR, right? That's where the work gets done. That's where, that's where the magic happens, as they say. And so, um, so it, it, it the, the actual story, um, the very short version was I started, I, I came out of school, went into sales. Sales led me eventually into executive recruiting. Um, I, I got that job literally as a sales job. I didn't even know what I was getting into. Um, I was selling people apparently and I uh, fell in love with the dynamics between uh, what, you know, what makes a person and a job work or a person and organization work. And then that kind of the rest is history from there. Well, I've always said HR, especially recruiting, it's just sales. I, I've said that for a long time. So I've been there as well. You know, that starting out in, in sales, you know, HR sales of re, uh, third party recruiting, cold calling those potential candidates to, you know, you've been an employee, you've been at, at the executive level, and now you're in consulting. So with that background in recruiting and leading from the inside, how has that shaped you as a consultant? And what are some of the issues you see trending into 2019? One of the things that I think as for me, I, when I came into corporate America, I came in by nature of having been a, uh, an entrepreneur and had, had built up kind of a small uh, recruiting shop. And so I had managed and led people and I understood, you know, teams. And so I got to jump in my, my first corporate job. I came in as a manager in an HR team. But like right away for me, there were so many things about the way that organizations worked internally or the way that the dynamics of politics and how things got done just didn't make sense to me. And there's so many processes that seemed sort of asinine and I couldn't really understand like why would a person do it this way? And especially coming out of sales. You know, when you're in sales, and I remember this from very early on, like one of the lessons I remember when I was, my first job was selling copiers, which is one of the worst, hardest jobs. And I was doing um, a small rural territory. So I had all these small towns and I had to go into town and would literally cold call face to face, trying to prospect for uh, copier sales. My sales manager, I remember one day, we had showed up at some business, uh, kind of in the middle of nowhere on the uh, the side of a small town. We walked in the front door, and we approached the. This was early on in my in my illustrious sales career, so I was learning. And we approached the the gatekeeper, the receptionist, and asked, you know, did our shtick, and she shut us down. Didn't get anywhere, but we did get, I think, a name or something. And so we walked out the door, and my uh, my sales manager's name was Randy. I was headed back to the car and he's like, no, hey, come here. He's like, let's, let's take a little walk. And so we walked. This was a standalone kind of a manufacturing or shipping place. So we walked around the building to the back of the building and they had a, you know, a garage door. It was like open, you know, like where they were set people in and out or maybe it was a nice day. I don't remember. But he literally just walked around the back. We walked in the back door found somebody walking just walking around and they and they're like hey can i help you and he's like yeah we were uh we, we maybe got turned around we were trying to find and she he gave the name of the person the lady said that we need to talk to and this person is like oh yeah his office is right over there and so we literally like walked over to his office and walked <laughs> in and i i've never forgotten that because the thing is in sales like for him you know, like you could, you could have said, well, let's let the, the receptionist or the process or the rejection get in the way. But like, he was like, no, we're going to make this work. Like we, we aren't going to get anything out of this if we don't find the person to talk to who can make a decision. That idea of the only thing that matters is making it happen. And sometimes making it happen means you got to do things unconventionally or the straightest line, you know, the straightest path sometimes isn't, isn't a straight line. You got to connect a few other dots. And so that, shaped how I thought about everything. That kind of beginning, I think, that shaped a, a lot of how I think about uh, the work I do now. It's like, what is the practical way? What is the way that makes the most sense, regardless of how we've done it in the past, or regardless of how many people are going to tell us that, yeah, that's not the way we do it. And so that that's pretty, that colors a lot of how, or helps, I think, explain at least a little bit of how I see the world. The other, what, the other part you asked about was 2000. 
2019. 2019. I mean, I, I I find this to be a really interesting time for for those of us that are in the 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 work of HR and workplace because I think we're at this edge where we're starting to really. I think that we're on the verge of a breakthrough. I don't know that how much of it's going to come in 2019, but I think we're standing right or we're getting very close to the edge of the cliff where we finally start to recognize or lean more into this idea of, of understanding human beings and human behavior and starting to redesign workplace around that. It seems like there's more conversation about that. There's more movement that way. Technology is starting to be designed in a way that facilitates that. So um, so I'm, I'm optimistic about where we're headed relative to that. I think there's going to be a lot more conversation next year about the human workplace in the sort of a continuing path in that direction. A lot of the stuff we're seeing in the space where I live in performance and engagement is trending towards better practice, you know, more, more regular conversation, more actual human interaction and all of that. So I think, I don't know if I expect 2019 to be a huge breakthrough year, but I think we're, we're trending the right direction. I continue. I, I think that'll continue next year. Jason, uh, you yeah had looked at your website and, you know, and we're going to be talking a little bit about your latest book, but I know a lot of the presentations and things that you do have been focused on employee engagement. And where do you see the big gaps for employers when it comes to being successful? You know, I know you, you talk about it on, on your show a bit and without giving all the secrets away, you know, what's, what's one thing that our listeners, the employers they work for, what could they focus on to be better at that employee engagement component? Wow. Well, and I'll, I'll give all my secrets away because I don't think the secrets are the differentiators. I think it's the ability to actually do the work that, uh, that gets in the way. So one of the biggest obstacles we have, I think, around the work of employee engagement is that we, despite the fact we've been at it for a couple of decades, um, at least calling it employee engagement, it's still really a poorly understood concept. It's there's no standard of definition. Every person you talk to, every consultant you talk to will give you a different definition. And half of those definitions are not in any way connected back to performance, organizational performance. And and I think until we and so as a as a practitioner, if you want to make progress, first thing you have to ask yourself is why do we care about employee engagement and get really clear about that? And that should involve some clarity around when you when you use the word engagement, what does that mean? What does that mean at your organization, and why does it matter? Because if you can't answer those two questions clearly, then everything else you're doing feels. I mean, this is where we lose our executives, is because we walk in and we talk about engagement to the executives as if it's this thing, this real tangible thing, and the executives are like, I don't, they don't know what engagement feels very squishy to them. And so unless we can make it tangible and connect it back to something they care about, it's hard for them to get excited about it and get behind it. And so I think it starts with that clarity around what it is. And then from there, then you can start aligning your practices to or your approaches to that. If you do a survey or if you're doing you know, training or recognition programs or whatever else it is, management training, all of that can align and connect back to that. But I think that's where it starts getting that clarity. So Jason, um, you have a book that just came out, very exciting, um, Unlocking High Performance, and uh, had a chance to chat with you about it a little bit. But um, so let's talk about it. What led you to write the book and what's been the reaction so far? Yeah, the, the, what led me to write it was I felt, uh, felt like it was time. And you know, in the nature of the business that I'm in as a, as a speaker and an advisor, someone who, you know, trades on, on being a thought leader, you got to write books and it was time to write another one. And, and it felt like also that, um, and, and actually originally I wanted to write a book about engagement and the publisher I ended up connecting with said, uh, there was, they felt like there was a gap in the market for a good book about performance kind of as we were in the midst of this whole performance management sucks, the performance appraisal is garbage, you know, revolution we're in the middle of. Like, we need a book to help people figure out what to do with that. And so merge the two together to hopefully provide not only, you know, my goal was to provide a book that, that both will challenge and change your thinking to help you think and understand about and understand performance better, but then also to provide 
the resources and the guidance and the tools you need to actually go recreate, reinvent what perform what managing performance looks like at your organization and do it in a way that both creates, you know, that unleashes performance through a great employee experience that feels great to the employee, but also gains you access to more of your employees' potential. And so that's why I wrote it is I thought it was it was time and I and I hope that it helps people as a as a tool to drive change. Reaction so far has been good. Um, I, you know, but I'm always, I don't know, call me a skeptic. Um, but you know, people, once, once the book's written, people do one of two things. They either tell you they like it or they tell you nothing. Um, most people don't come and tell you that your book sucks. (laughs) They're just nice people generally. So, um, I haven't had any of those. So I think that's, I guess that's a good start. And the people that have read it, (laughs) <laughs> tend to be giving me at least decent feedback. And so, so far, so good. I'll take it. Well, I have to say very quickly that I heard, Jason, before you came on, Wendy informed me that she is in the book. Is. So there's no way it could suck if she's involved in it. And <laughs> that much more exciting to, that we have you on because she's like, oh, I didn't tell you. No, you didn't tell me. I think that's fantastic. <laughs> that's- yeah, there's a cool, uh, there's a cool story of the some of the work that she was doing. So, yeah, she's yeah. in there. Oh, it was well, and I, I, Jason, I loved how you had that little that little Zoom group. Oh, I guess it was almost a year ago, um, just to kind of you know feel out people and, and talk about it. And um, I mean, I know I learned a lot during that that little session. So um, you know, hey, other authors, there you go. Get get some live uh, live feedback. Um, just put it out on Twitter. I think that's where I saw. Yeah, that. it was. We did. Yeah, it was a. It was just an experiment. I think we did a an ask me anything Zoom discussion, and for anybody that yeah. wanted to pop on and have a conversation about performance management and ask or answer questions, and um, yeah, it was cool. It was, that was a fun conversation. Yeah. I learned uh, stuff in that conversation too. It was great. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. Well, Jason, it is now time for everyone's favorite part of our show, the Half Hour Question Connection. Um, I'm actually going to turn it over to John, and he's going to kick off the Question Connection tonight. Jason, talk to us a little about networking and and how it's helped in your career and what's been really effective for you when it comes to networking. That's a that's that, that's a dangerous question to ask me because because I uh, you know the, the social gravity is about networking. It's about social capital and how to build the social capital you need to be successful. And so it's this dangerous question, but I, I will do my best. Networking has been critical for me. I can trace everything that I have accomplished of any substance in my in my life back to relationships where it would not have been possible without that person supporting me, helping me, or giving me a, a boost along the way. And so my network is everything. It's the most powerful tool that I have. It's the most powerful resource resource I have available to me. So that said, I would say what's been effective for me in networking, that there's a bunch of there's a you know, like I said, I could I could I, I go stand on stage and talk for hour an hour or two about this. But the thing I would say is most powerful for me is just being, I I think, saying yes to the opportunities to connect. So when people reach out, when they want to talk, even if I don't always know why or or who they are or what we might get out of it, um, I'm often prone to say yes to those conversations and lean into that. And I've met some really cool people. I don't prejudge a connection before it happens often. And so I think that's really important because I think we tend to we tend to kind of select even before you have the opportunity to know someone how much value you're going to get out of it. That's that's so that's so true. And you know, I was listening to um, the Good Place podcast, which I'll put a shout out for them as really interesting podcast. Um, but one of the actors on there was talking about how he almost didn't go to the pod to the Good Place audition because he didn't know that he was actually going to be on or if he wanted to be on. But you know, ne- he was like, you never know where one audition is, audition is going to lead you next. And I think it's the same thing with networking. You don't know who you're going to meet at that, you know, at that event, or if someone reaches out, you don't know. So you need to take the chance on that because it could lead to something really awesome. Absolutely. Well, and it's like a random, like a random Zoom conversation. Yeah, well, yeah exactly. <laughs> and I also think it's about like, I, you know, the word networking gets in people's way. 
And, you know, if you think about it instead as friend building or relationship building or whatever, and don't worry about whatever you want to call it, but just build, invest in relationships with other human beings. And, and uh, the power of that multiplies. It's exponential if you, if you do it over time. Exactly. So, Jason, um, who do you follow um, for uh, HR Insights? I tend to... Well, the people that the people that I I like how their brain works. Um, John Sumser is uh, I'm a fan of John and well John and Heather Bussing as well. I'm a fan of uh, I, I like Josh Burson's stuff um, from an industry perspective. Um, I I also I like people who kind of dance around the fringes who maybe aren't traditional HR people like I'm a big fan of of you know the people like the the Dan Pinks um David Burkus you know Brene Brown you wouldn't I don't know if you call her an HR um an HR person but she's she's definitely everything about what she does is relevant to HR um Adam Grant you know these are all people who I think are are doing some really exceptional um thought leadership uh in that uh that I that I uh, admire Jason, talk a little bit about how you enjoy giving back to the HR community. Yeah, there's a lot of a lot of ways. I have a I obviously have a, a soft spot in my heart for HR uh, because I, you know, having spent close to a decade of my life on the on the practitioner side, I I know how hard that job is, and I know there's a lot of really good people in there that are you know showing up every day. I'm trying to make the workplace better and fighting against a bunch of resistance um, from people that just don't get it yet. And so I think that's why I, I try to, a lot of what I do now, granted, I'm trying to make, you know, I'm also trying to make a living in a lot of ways, but a lot of the stuff I do is free. Um, I, I think most anybody or a lot of people would tell you, I, I offer it all the time from a networking perspective is that if someone reaches out to me and says, Hey, I'd really like to talk to you about this. I will take that call. I haven't in a while done it, but I've um I try to like once a year do a half or a full day of just open time with like half hour slots where people in my at least on my on my email list can grab a half hour to talk to me about whatever they want to talk about. They can use it for a half hour of free consulting or they can, some people will get on and want to ask questions about, they want to become a speaker. And so they want tips about that and others, you know, whatever. But I, I try to make myself available. I also here in Omaha um, where I live, um, I try to do a lot of things to give back to my community here. So when I get asked to support the local HR community, I tend to go out. I mean, Disrupt HR is a good example of that. I try to get involved and support the community in, in ways that I can. So keep trying to, to, to make the, the community smarter and more well-equipped to drive change when I can. So, Jason, what's your favorite movie? Probably The First Matrix. Maybe oh. Pulp Fiction. Pulp Fiction is a big favorite of mine, too. Those are probably two that are top of the list. How about your favorite musician or band? You know, I that's that one is tough for me. I don't know that I have. Um, I, you know, probably if I think back to when I when I spent my most time listening to like religiously kind of was really into music, it was in the, you know, the kind of the hairband era. So Van Halen. Um, Aerosmith. I was a big extreme fan. People make fun of me for that, but I loved their music. So <laughs> this is what it is. I'll own it. <laughs> There's nothing oh. wrong with that, Jason. But no. I don't think anybody else is extreme yet. No, I don't I'll own think that. So. I'll take it. I still, I still go back and listen <laughs> to that stuff uh, even now. So it's all good. How about a favorite TV show? You know, I have a few. There's such great, there's so much great TV out there um, these days. But probably my favorite is Peaky Blinders on Netflix or BBC, I guess, is where. Uh, oh, it's a great show. I might have to great check show. that out. I haven't even. Yeah, heard it's of like that. a, it's kind of an Irish version of uh, Sopranos set back in the in the like <laughs> early 1900s. It's awesome. Peaky Blinders. All right, I'm gonna look that Peaky up. Peaky Blinders. I need yeah, it's show. awesome. 
It's awesome. And here's what I'll tell you. Somebody told me about this. It starts out the first two episodes are, are there's there's a lot of like character building and background setting. The first two episodes a little slow, but if you make it to like okay. episode three, then you're hooked. <laughs> it's amazing. It's a great show. Good to know. Awesome. Jason, as I look at the list, try to make connection. I, I, we're similar vintage when it comes to music. I have to say, when you said Matrix, I, I almost laughed out loud because that was the year that Star Wars Episode One came out, and I was still teaching public school at the time. And all the kids were really upset because I went to opening night of Star Wars, and I went back to school the next day, and, hey, Mr. Thurman saw the movie. I had my movie ticket, and the kids all freaked out. Uh, but then The Matrix came out that summer, and I'm like, it's the best science fiction movie that came out that yeah, year. Right. It was so much better than Star Wars. Yeah. <laughs> I I, uh, I still like you. St- I I still go back and watch that movie, and it it still blows my mind. I mean, there's still layers of things in that movie that I pick up even after watching it. How many times? It's just a, it was just such a great, brilliant movie. It, it holds up, and I and I will go on the record because this movie doesn't get enough respect. The Wachowskis also made uh, Speed Racer, and that is the most underrated family film of the last fifteen years. That movie was fantastic. And nobody, nobody picked up the family component of it. I loved it. Huh? But, I, I've not seen that movie, so that that's on my list now. It, 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 you watch it on a big screen because the the picture and the, you know just the imagery is quite striking. But it really, at the end of the day, it's all about the racer family and how they're close. Huh. Now, a lot of people think I'm crazy about that, but uh-huh. I saw it with my kids when they were very young in the theater and it's one of our favorites. So no anyway, kidding. awesome. And, and a total departure from the matrix when it comes, you know, it's a family film with a, with a chimp and, you know, a kid driving a race car, but <laughs> oh, good, we'll check it out. so yeah, having said all that, if you're, if you're not watching those movies, listening to the hair metal time or watching Peaky Blinders, what else do you like to do outside of work? Well, you, right now I'm at the, this will be the cliche type of answer, but I mean, my, my kids are nine and 10. And so they're in that kind of, you know, it's, if it's not being at like a soccer game or a basketball game or hauling my daughter to art classes or theater stuff or whatever, it's just like they're, they're busy. So we, you know, our life is increasingly consumed by that, but it's that it's running, um, running and walking the dog, listening to true crime podcasts. I'm kind of obsessed with true crime podcasts. You know, and then I'm a I'm a sports fan too. So I'm a a Duke basketball fan. So like Tuesday begins my favorite time of year. Um, I'm a Niners fan in football, which is kind of painful this year. But um, but yeah, we so we watch a lot of sports at our house too. I I'm giving up on football. I'm, the Vikings are breaking my heart again. So um, they had a decent week this I, week. Yeah, it's just hard. I'm gonna, to start binge watching on Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> That's, hey, listen, whatever it takes. There's some good stuff on Netflix. There's a lot of good stuff out there, and so I, I'm going to catch up. So, Jason, um, if you weren't out consulting in the uh, HR profession, what do you think you'd be doing professionally? Well, yeah, you know the funny part of that question is I, you know, I do some consulting, but a majority of my work is speaking and um, speaking and writing, and so. If it wasn't, you know, I don't know what else I would do. I, I don't know that I can even, th- you know, uh, think about it. I would probably be speaking and writing about something else. I'd be, you know, trying to fix the accounting profession or um, IT or something. I think I would still be out trying to do thought leadership on something because I think that's just, I like to think about things and try to make them better and then help other people think better about those things and take action to make them better. So, I, I would probably just have, I'd choose a different flavor, but I'd probably still be doing the same kinds of things because I feels like this is what I was built to do. Well, Jason, I'll be the first one to go on record that I'm glad you're not doing something else. I, I really do appreciate yes. what you're doing for the profession and that you took some time with us tonight to chat a little bit. You, you survived the question connection. You survived the conversation at large. And again, I, I thank you. Uh, you know, like I said, when I first started really started listening to some of the stuff you were doing. It got me really jazzed. And when I remember when Wendy said, oh, I'm going to have coffee with him. I'm like, you're so lucky. You know, like, I look forward to getting <laughs> you down the road. For those listeners that aren't connected with you, aren't following you right now, this is your chance to, to let them know what's the best way to reach out there. 
the, the best place if you want to just find more information about what I do, uh, jasonlauritsen.com is the easiest place to find me, or you can email me, reach out, jason at jasonlauritsen.com is my email address. I'm easy to find there. And it due to the nature of what I do, if you type my name into the Google, uh, it will give you lots of ways to find me on social media and every place else. And so I try to be pretty easy to to find. And if you reach out to me, I will respond. I, I, um, I like to engage with people. So if you have a question or you want to chat, hit me up. We will add that to the show notes for sure. Wendy, how about you? What's the best way for the listeners to contact you? Best way to find me is on my blog, mydailyjourney.com. Daily is D as in dog, A-I-L-E-Y. And of course, the fourth Sunday of each month, you will find me on Twitter as part of the monthly HR uh, social hour Twitter chat. That's 7 p.m. fourth Sunday of each month. How about you, John? You go to hrsocialhourpodcast.podbean.com. You'll find all my social links there. Maybe you might find an episode as we approach that 50th one. If you ha- if there's a one of those first 44 that you haven't listened to before this one, take give it a download. Take a listen, rate, review, share. Help us to continue to build our community. We would really, really appreciate it. Again, Jason, really appreciate you being with us tonight. So for the HR Social Hour Half Hour Podcast, I'm John. And I'm Wendy. And as always, be sure to connect. Give back and network. Network. Take care, everyone. We'll see you soon.